human rights. Um, and we do have some copies around. We just printed a copy that you can see over there. Um, <laughs> and there are also, if you go to our website, uh, it's internetrightsandprinciples.org, I believe, you can also uh, see it in the online version. And as a process, it was really robust. Uh, we had, any, it was a really open process. Absolutely anyone could join in. We had wikis, we had lots of phone consultations, we had um, lots of consultations in person in various IGFs and other fora. Um, we had a group of experts. I can see one sitting in the back over there, Miriam Marzuki, uh, who are human rights experts that went through that data and tried to make it as, as concrete as possible. And um, it's an ongoing process as well, I should say that, that we've had, I think it's about three versions of the charter now. We've never said this is the final version. This is still something we're working on and it's still um, a growing and, and hopefully strengthening document. Um, when the real first charter came out, which I think was in about 2010, if I remember correctly, the environment was quite different. This was before Frank LaRue did his big report, um, the UN Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, around how freedom of expression applied to the internet. It was before the Human Rights Council made their famous resolution that human rights apply online as much as they do offline. It was before the NSA PRISM scandal. So the, environment that the environment's changing quite rapidly. Some things for the good and many things not for the good. Another thing that's been changing over those last few years is the statement of principles within the internet governance field. Um, as you probably see, there are sets of principles coming out from all sorts of different avenues and all sorts of different forums. Um, lots of other groups have come up with them. There's, of course, the OECD principles, Council of Europe principles, G8 principles, many, many more. Just recently, we've seen the Seoul framework coming out of the Seoul um, the Seoul Cyberspace Conference just last week. Um, Dilma's speech to the General Assembly, of course, was bringing up her own set of five principles, and that's something that they sounds like they're going to try and um, develop through the Rio Summit as well. So principles are something that there are many, many of, and clearly the reason there are many of is that people think that that has some kind of value in the internet governance field to try and develop these principles. Um, I also think there's a question at the moment, if we're moving from norm creation and lots of groups trying to develop these sets of principles to some kind of hardening, potentially. Um, in particular, you'll see there's an IGF workshop, I believe it's tomorrow, that's looking at these different sets of principles and how we can bring them together potentially into some overarching set of principles for the internet. Um, and of course, the Rio Summit, if it goes ahead and does try to do this, is trying to make something more definitive than I guess what we've had in the past. So given these kind of changing contexts, what we wanna, there are kind of three things that we're aiming to do today. One is we're trying to highlight potentially what could be called neglected human rights issues. As I said before, when we did this process, we were working with the full eight UDHR. But whenever you see human rights mentioned, it tends to be about freedom of expression and privacy, which are, of course, two of the core, core rights, but there are many others which are important as well, and we don't want them to get lost. So that's one thing we're trying to do today. And anything you can bring to these things are very welcome. The second is how can we use human, how can we use documents like principles and charters to better protect human rights in the internet environment? Um, we've got this charter, there's the APC charter, there are other sets of principles. How can they be used as living documents um, to enforce human rights? And the final thing that we really want to try and begin to address is looking at if there is a hardening of principles going on at the moment, how can we engage in those processes to make sure that human rights aren't forgotten in that process or aren't sidelined? So those are our kind of three goals 
with my very distinguished panel. We're also looking at feeding in these goals into many of the other workshops. We're gonna feed them into the IRP workshop, which is looking on how to bring the charter specifically forward. We're also gonna feed in outcomes from this discussion into the main one about internet governance principles. So please do engage, bring your thoughts to the table, see what we can do. Uh, I have a really great panel, which I'm very happy to introduce to you. I think I'll do it one by one um, as, as they come to speak. So we're starting by a kind of brief overview of some of what we're calling neglected human rights and maybe the role of charter and principles in relation to them. I'm gonna start with Pranesh Prakash, who is the policy director at the Center for Internet Society in India. He's also a policy fellow at Yale Law School and he's gonna talk about the rights of the visually impaired. Thank you so much, Dixie. Uh, first off, uh, I shouldn't be here. Uh, it should actually be my colleague Nirmitha Narasimhan, who uh, herself is blind and who uh, many of you who've been to the uh, to either the Hyderabad or Sharm IGFs uh, might have had a chance to meet. I am here, in, I guess, in a representative capacity. Uh, at CIS, uh, as I mentioned, my colleagues Nirmitha and Anandi are blind. Uh, so all the internal communications we have uh, within CIS have to be accessible. Uh, all of the material we put out uh, as CIS uh, have to be accessible. And, and so this, the, the, the issue of accessibility for persons uh, who are blind uh, and other persons who are disabled is something that, go, that is for me a little, something a little bit more personal uh, as well. This issue is addressed in the IRP uh, in principle number 13, uh, which is the rights of people with disabilities and the internet. And the first one emphasizes uh, uh, that is a uh, recital accessibility to the internet for persons with disability uh, s uh, that that persons with disabilities have a right to access on an equal basis with others to the internet and it talks about standards uh, and guidelines for accessibility but very importantly not just the development and promulgation of such standards but monitoring which is right now the biggest thing that is lacking so the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability, the Dynamic Coalition on, on Open Standards have in the past focused on the importance of uh, within the IGF of ensuring accessibility. Uh, this year, uh, I must regret to say that the IGF processes haven't been the most uh, accessibility friendly. Uh, some of the pages uh, that, are, that are online, for instance, there is no immediate apparent way how to get the schedule in an accessible format because most of the links actually point to an inaccessible version of the schedule. Uh, and, and so there is still a lot to be done, even at home, uh, in a matter of speaking. And uh, there are things such as the web content accessibility guidelines, which the uh, W3C has come out with, and, uh, and ARIA, et cetera. So there are standards around these areas, uh, but what is lacking to a great extent is monitoring. In India as well, uh, as far back as I th 2010, the Indian government, uh, late 2009, 2010, uh, the Indian government uh, actually accept, uh, put out guidelines for web, uh, for, uh, for web, all governmental websites. Part of those guidelines included guidelines on accessibility. We decided to see how well they fare. And uh, one of the, so we actually decided to go through 9,000 uh, Indian government websites to find out whether they actually were accessible. The first finding was that not everything that was listed in the official list of government websites actually existed. Uh, so uh, around a third of the, of the web pages we expected to be there actually didn't exist. Apart from that, uh, we also found out that the bulk of the websites that there are, that the government of India has run, and which it is under an obligation to make accessible, actually weren't accessible at all. We provided this report to the government, uh, which is now coming up with uh, a revised version of these uh, web uh, site guidelines, and, and uh, hopefully there should be progress on that. So monitoring is something uh, that is generally very lacking, and I'm glad that 
that uh, this is uh, this is mentioned here. The second uh, idea that is uh, mentioned uh, in this is B, availability and affordability of the internet. Uh, that steps must be taken to ha to provide uh, persons with disabilities uh, both content in a suitable format as well as uh, ensure that it is uh, available and uh, and provided them at an affordable cost. Now, this is where uh, ideas or uh, some of the work that, that we at CIS are doing, but that people all over the world are doing on, uh, on assistive technologies, especially with, uh, made in with free and open source software uh, built on open standards is, is essential. Uh, because without with proprietary software, uh, it just you just can't get the price points that you need. Uh, to give an example, JAWS is one of the most widely used screen readers in the world. Uh, but how most people in India have access to JAWS is through piracy, and uh, and some of this piracy is uh, is uh, in a sense officially condoned as well because. Every each copy of JAWS costs multiple months uh, average salary in India, okay, and and it just is not affordable, and 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 I'm talking about average salary of of uh, able-bodied people, right, uh, and and we do know and studies have shown that persons with disabilities do not earn the same, so for them it is much much harder to have access to screen readers, uh, which are proprietary in a, in a legal way, which is where projects such as uh, the uh, NVDA project, the non-visual desktop access project, or uh, the ARCA project, where, where software like that really have to, uh, have to step in. Uh, I will, uh, I just wanted to mention those, but I also want to briefly touch upon the idea of whether these kinds of statements of principles and whether just high level uh, ideas like this are useful at all. Recently, uh, I was involved in, uh, in uh, as part of a civil society contingent at WIPO during the negotiations of the Marrakesh Treaty to facilitate access to published work for the blind, visually impaired, and otherwise print disabled. That's a mouthful, but the Treaty for the Blind is, uh, is a great new step at WIPO, which for the first time asserts that human rights uh, of persons with disabilities, specifically of the blind, have to be given reachage within the copyright system. That the copyright system isn't only about owners of copyright, that the users have copyright, especially uh, blind people in this instance have to, and, and their human rights to access to works has to be uh, given importance to. And a large, and and a large part of the discussions uh, during the negotiations, uh, when when things were at a at a uh, you know when things sometimes tended to uh, come up to uh, a standstill, someone would point out the obligations of most of those nations under the UN Convention uh, for uh, the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and that. Ten had sometimes the uh, th uh, the effect of breaking that standstill, of saying that there is an important principle that we are working towards, which has to be given given uh, importance, and and so the UNCRPD actually became a, a part of the negotiation text as well in multiple uh, in, at, at multiple times, and and so uh, even though. The UNCRPD is applicable only to nation states to apply as they see fit within their own national systems, but the principles contained in that became very important in the negotiation of this new treaty. And this new treaty will uh, has already uh, is, is starting to bear effect uh, because uh, industry was also uh, there, especially the, uh, those parts of the industry which are uh, which are dedicated to providing greater access to, uh, to blind people, and they've already started making use of this treaty. So the treaty itself is useful, but the UNCRPD was 
was referenced multiple times, and this, those high-level statements uh, of principle were also very important. So just want to end it there. Thanks uh, a lot, Jack Singh. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to move on to another potentially ne neglected issue, and that's I'm going to hand over to Marion Franklin at the University of Goldsmiths to talk to us about the right to education. Right, thanks very much. Uh, good morning. Yes, I'm here in my uh, capacity as an educator as opposed to my current capacity here as co-chair of the IRP coalition. So I'm putting on another hat. It's the hat that pays my wages and gets me on the plane to here. But it is an overlooked area, um, the educational setting, and it's the setting on wh in which many of the issues we're dealing with at the high level and at the everyday level often converge, and uh, we don't often realize this. So what I'm going to relate to is, of course, the clause in the charter, which is, um, let me just get there, Clause 10, the right to education on and about the internet. And of course, this links, of course, to disability issues as well and disadvantaged access points. But it also links to Clause 11, the right to culture and access to knowledge. So I'm going to outline some of the very, very real everyday situations that one is dealing with as learning, the way we find out about the world, goes more and more online. Um, just because our students from two years old um, school entry right up to university, a PhD level, take for granted that most of the knowledge, most of the resources they're going to access are online. This is a great thing. But of course, universities and schools are having to make huge investments decisions about what kind of software platforms they're going to use, what kind of access they're going to allow, for instance, whether uh, university libraries allow open access to the web or whether they put in filters to stop, usually the excuse is stop students wasting time. Um, whether one as an educator makes use of commercial uh, platforms such as Facebook, because our students are all on Facebook, uh, what's the point of creating and generating a university level uh, virtual learning environment when they're all on Facebook anyway? So these sorts of things are confronting us. So in fact, we're looking at the digitalization of education in a positive sense. Um, but given that the Charter is talking about education through the internet and mentions specifically virtual learning environments, the issue about open access and open data, educational resources that are accessible and uh, affordable, because of course in most many schooling and university situations there's a huge divide in resources. Those that are rich, large, prominent universities, rich schools in particularly large cities like London, um, or New York, they can access the most expensive and the most efficient and the most well-run kinds of platforms. Others are strapped for cash. And this goes right down to the classroom. This goes right down to what generation of computers, what generation of operating systems are accessible to these students. This goes right down to what's called digital literacy or computer skills. This goes right down to what sort of content are these uh, students accessing. How do teachers change their very teaching practices, their very pedagogy, to, to take advantage of the wonderful opportunities? What do libraries do? Do they digitize all their literature, which most of them are doing? They create electronic resources, and yet students still need to know what a book looks like. Or do they? So these are not just um, issues we deal with in the classroom every day, but they have serious financial implications. The example I want to use is when a university discovers that the email use and the um, online calendar use far exceeds their server capacities in-house, of course, there are some very attractive and very cost-efficient forms of outsourcing. This is often called cloud computing. I don't want to get into a semantic discussion here. But what is, is the case in the UK is that a large number of universities have signed up to Microsoft and have been given a much more efficient platform from which to run their email and their calendar services. But this generates all sorts of other issues about proprietary software versus free and open, um, access, uh, free and open source software. At the same time, in the university in which I work, we operate our own in-house virtual learning environment, which is open source, uh, Moodle. Um, so immediately looks, and forgive me for saying, but I support it wholeheartedly from, a, um, from, a, a, from my own point of view, is it looks somewhat clunky and old school. So here you have students who say, why aren't we on Facebook? 
why are we on Facebook? And they start a Facebook group. I don't know how many Facebook groups are for my program. And I think, fine. But the issue with ad tracking is very important. When you're talking about popular culture, you're talking about films. So there's a decision. Many people don't see this as an issue. But we're in a knowledge place. We're in an institution for debate. And we want to talk about things. And we want to do it in such a way that is free and open and debate is allowed. And we have students coming from parts of the world where some of the topics they are discussing are not necessarily easy to debate. So the issue about who is tracking whom, uh, what they're saying online, if they do this on Facebook, how they might be traced. We have students have very, very deep issues about this. They're dealing with sexual education. They're dealing with confronting new ideas and new knowledge. So the thing about education from the point of view of saying human rights, um, I want to take up Pranesh's point that if you take it right down, you look bottom up every day, two-year-olds are now learning to read, are learning basic numeracy schools, skills with touch pads. Uh, amazing. I've seen, I used to teach in a young, at the young entrance level way back in another life. You used to teach them to read with books. You now teach them to read with screens. So I'm not going to get into debate which is better or not. I'm happy they learn to read at all. And we know that the research is that children's literacy is increasing through using online. They're not decreasing. The point is, what happens when a child goes up to a fish tank and tries to move the fish? Um, what they need to know is that we're looking more at just skill building. These young children know how to use these instruments extremely well, in fact, better than their teachers and their parents. The literacy programs we're talking about is to allow them to make informed choices about where they, where they debate their knowledge. So when we're talking about virtual learning environments and education on the internet, it's actually a very nitty-gritty everyday choice that concerns management, investment, concerns teachers, curriculum, and it concerns children and young people and uh, not so young people going back to university about the kinds of places they debate. And because it's like something you don't really talk about, I think uh, the charter allows us to think about the high level principle about if we have the right to access information and learn online in a free and open way, then we can start to break it down and get down to ground level. So on that level, it's been very useful to think as an educator at this point. And I hope we can debate that. I have a whole list of things that we can talk about that I'm sure others will bring up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marianne. Um, I will now hand over to Joy Lidicott, who is with the Association for Progressive Communications, to talk about another neglected issue and perhaps to offer some setback um, considerations about where this discussion is going, and uh, yes, Joy. Thanks, uh, thanks, Dixie. Kia ora, everybody. Uh, I think we're still morning. Um, I wanted to just reflect on the importance of the charter and charter-like uh, instruments in relation to our own discourse as internet governance participants. Uh, and how we might strategize to be using the charter uh, in, in some more creative ways. And I'm, I'm thinking particularly that since um, there's been a huge amount of change in human rights movements in the last 20 years. So we have, for example, since 1993 in the Vienna Declaration, uh, which really for the first time saw, in relation to women's human rights, uh, rape as a crime of war. Uh, you know, which is only 20 years ago that uh, these norm new normative standards have been um, developed. Uh, and we've also seen, as Pranisha said, uh, changes in new standards for disabled people. We've got ILO Convention 169 in relation to the rights of indigenous people. And we have more and more new standards emerging all the time. So in that sense, the Charter itself needs to always be speaking. It can't be a moment in time that captures only uh, the, the issues and thoughts that we have, that the concerns that we have at any particular moment, needs to be able to respond to the wider human rights context and discourse and the movements which are changing uh, and developing rapidly. And I think the Charter really does that. Uh, uh, it, it, it does include specific provisions around gender empowerment and women's equality. But I think what we've seen in relation to women and internet governance is that we've really stagnated uh, in this forum. And I think that we need to squarely address it. I mean, I've just come from another workshop where you know, local Indonesian feminist activists are very upset about Miss Internet Bali. 
uh, that in this day and age we can have this kind and no offense to her personally but to have this kind of sexist um, demonstration in this kind of forum is just completely unacceptable uh, we still have a very poor discussion about women's participation in internet governance and we look at some of the panels the multi-stakeholder panels please fill in your gender report cards about um, particularly you know the government uh, and private sector um, panels and the participation uh, based on gender there We've seen the emergence, I think, primarily through the leadership of the women's rights movement, uh, much greater push on internet-related policy than we have from internet rights activists. So if we think, for example, about violence against women online, stalking, harassment, Facebook rape campaigns, uh, we've seen, um, and the cyber sex legislation that's developed, for example, in Philippines, we've seen the huge amount of leadership from women's rights activists saying, taking existing standards and saying, uh, you know, these new forms of technology are creating new forms of violations that we need remedies and actions for. And I think that as um, internet rights activists, we've got more work to do to respond to that adequately and properly uh, and, and to think more deeply about how to respond to um, the development of new remedies. Um, another issue that we, we're seeing very much neglected is around the rule of law, uh, particularly in relation to revelations of mass surveillance. Um, most human rights defenders and women's human rights defenders are not saying that this is a failure of internet governance. They don't want a new internet governance mechanism to respond to this concern. They see it squarely as a human rights violation and they want human rights remedies for this because surveillance is not a new issue for many. Um, in fact, uh, Eastern European countries, many countries have lived under all forms of surveillance for many decades. So I think our ability to respond to those concerns from an internet perspective also needs some challenge. And that's where I think the Charter um, has been neglected in terms of its ability to facilitate and enable um, more uh, diverse human rights organisations to, to come into internet-related um, policy uh, discussions uh, on the issues that are, are of concern to them uh, and in ways that also meet our, our concerns around multi-stakeholder, bottom-up internet, internet policies. Um, and I'd certainly like us to be thinking about um, uh, the Charter and, and we've talked about some of the, the neglected rights. I think there's a fantastic provision in it that relates to the right to an international order. Uh, and that's also a neglected area in terms of how we can make links with other rights-related movements focused on this. Um, so uh, I have um, lots of questions, lots of thoughts and ideas about that. Um, but I think in the interest of time, I'll just stop there and let the next speaker go. Thanks, Joy, and I'm sure there'll be time to come back to you for some of your other thoughts. Um, the IRP is a multi-stakeholder coalition, but perhaps... And to some extent, inevitably, because of the subject matter, most of our members do come from um, academia and from civil society. But we do have business and government um, members and participants. And now that we've had that kind of framing, um, I'd like to turn. We've got a, a representative of business and a representative of government and turn to them to see how documents like the Charter can be used by their constituencies to see what they think about these wider conceptions of rights. Is this something that's on their radar? Is this something that they are, are open to and now they're going to respond? And, and how do we develop on documents like the Charter? How do we move towards enforcement? Um, so I will start by passing over to Michael Nelson, who's joined us from Microsoft. Dixie, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Um, I have a somewhat unusual perspective. Um, you mentioned that I'm here from business. I'm also here from civil society. I've been working with the Internet Society almost since its foundation. And for the last five years, I've been an academic. And I still am teaching Internet Studies at Georgetown University. Uh, and previous to that, I spent 10 years working in government. So uh, I'm really, uh, I'm a multi-stakeholder man. <laughs> And I'll, I'll, I'll talk today with that perspective, because I've only been at Microsoft for two months. Uh, and so in many ways, I'm here to give you the big picture and the context and to talk about the practical question, how does a company like Microsoft respond to charters on human rights and how do we live the commitments that we've made? Um, 
I've been working on development of the internet for over 25 years, and I've been in the middle of a lot of the debates about policy. But I'm a technologist and a physicist, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm certainly not a human rights expert. I can impersonate a lawyer. I have spent a lot of time with them when I was working in the US government. Uh, so I'm also a futurist, and I think I, I, I hope that we'll have some time for a discussion about how future technologies will provide new challenges to human rights, but also new opportunities to help us uh, protect and promote human rights. And that's what I'm going to focus on today, uh, mostly focusing on how Microsoft is using technology to promote human rights around the world. How many of you have read Micros the Microsoft Global Human Rights Statement? I hadn't either until I joined Microsoft. It's a really impressive document. It's not so extraordinary that Microsoft has signed on to the Global Compact, like many other companies. What's extraordinary is, is there's actual concrete steps that the company has taken to make sure that it is in accordance with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and the IOL Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work. If you read this document, you see that we are taking steps not only to ensure that our employees are doing the right thing and to make sure that we're fostering human rights around the world, you also see that we're working with more than 60,000 contractors, vendors, suppliers, the people who make the chips who go into our equipment, the people who distribute our products. And we're also working with more than 600,000 business partners to make sure they're doing the right thing when it comes to human rights. And I think that's a key part of this process. You can't just turn to each company and say, what are you doing? You have to see how they're working with their ecosystem. One way we're doing that is through the Electronic Industry Citizenship uh, uh, Coalition, the IECC, which pertains to work conditions in the lab, in the uh, fabs, in the factories around the world that make the hardware that we rely upon. We're also very active members of the Global Network Initiative, which many of you are familiar with. Uh, it's an effort to work with companies from Yahoo to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, well, I, I don't know the entire list here, but th these are the companies that are, are providing many of the services we rely on every day. And they're facing real challenges when it comes to dealing with local laws in countries that have more repressive regimes. Another important human rights related activity is the Family Online Safety Institute. Again, we're big supporters of that, work very closely with Steve Balcom to protect children online. And you see, very importantly, that we're not just funding these outside organizations, we're doing things inside. So our day-to-day -day operations are guided by our commitments to equal opportunity, to anti-discrimination. Uh, as a new employee, I saw this myself. Just two months ago, I went through the Microsoft new employee orientation. And there was a lot of time spent on these issues, making sure that we are good corporate citizens, we treat our employees fairly, that we do the right thing, the moral thing. We have a, a digital crimes unit, which works to prevent use of the internet for human trafficking, for, for child safety. We, we try to promote child safety. We work with law enforcement around the world to fight child pornography. But I think the most important thing we're doing, and the reason I'm so excited to be in this panel, is because Microsoft is building the technologies that are going to make it much easier to support and foster human rights around the world. And we do this in thousands of different ways. One thing we're doing is providing our tools and technology for free to more than 100 different human rights organizations around the world. That's a small thing. The big thing we're doing is developing tools that are going to create new economic growth, bring people out of poverty so that they aren't faced with some of the conditions that breed the kind of problems that we're talking about today. When people are desperate and they're poor, they do things that are in violation of anyone's definition of human rights. 
So we're trying to foster development around the world using ICT. We're doing that in hundreds of countries, more than 100 countries. Uh, we work in countries that are not at the top of the Freedom House list of free countries. And we're there partly to engage with those governments, to push them in the right direction. And also, again, to help build the economics uh, system that's going to bring people to a better place so that they can uh, ensure the equal opportunity for everyone. And the last point is just to echo your point. Uh, Microsoft is pushing for good governance and rule of law because you can't you can't govern can't hope to have governments that enforce human rights if you don't have a functioning, capable government. Uh, that means promoting transparency. Means using the technologies we build to ensure that citizens can monitor what their governments are doing, and that that will then lead to better better uh, better human rights around the world. Happy to talk about many of the other issues, but uh, that's my quick take on how we're responding to the various charges on human rights and how we approach the whole issue. Thanks again for the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Michael, and we will have a chance to respond and ask more questions after our final panelist, which is Carl Fredrik Wettermark, who's joined us from the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. everyone. Pleasure to be here. Um, I would like to um, just briefly, I won't take up much of your time, but I will just briefly touch upon a few of these issues from a, um, from a government or rather from a um, foreign policy perspective. Um, I too, I too um, feel as a multi-stakeholder person being here, I'd like to consider myself as a um, Python programmer masquerading as a diplomat. Um, <laughs> So I'll, I'll do my best to be representative of the latter rather than the former. But um, I've, I've done a, a personally, I've done a journey from being um, working within, well, basically within systems development and programming to um, doing domestic ICT policy within Sweden and the European Union to now working on the international um, policy arena. And um, it's been very um, fulfilling to, to kind of follow that whole chain and see where all, all the... Um, where the process is lacking and where it, um, where it is actually efficient. And um, I think I would like to touch on the subject of um, how and if documents like um, this one um, do to matter for governments, because I think that's an issue that uh, often uh, is, is, um, uh, is discussed and, and, how, and also how, that it, how it matters. And just to give you a bit of a, an overview of, um, first of all, I just want to say, yes, they, d they do match immensely. Um, and I would like to briefly just describe um, the, the function of documents like this one within government settings. And kind of give you the, um, <laughs> what a bit of a, the uncertainty picture of how, how things actually go on within the government. Um, because truth is that uh, internet governance is very complicated, not just for, um, not just for um, developing countries or for, for companies, or for so it's very it's very difficult for for com uh, countries like mine as well. Um, the processes are extremely complicated. Um, it's very hard to get a grip on the um, fora's that are important to separate what's important from what's not important, and there's a tremendous lack of capacity, even from governments. Um, I would just like to illustrate that um, by. by um, by commending those of you who are in the best bits um, 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 sphere here on the amazingly well, uh, well made um, map over internet governance principles that's been pulled out here. Um, that's that's I, I, I actually put that on the um, actually put that on the big atlas of our foreign minister, uh, foreign ministers of um, desk, um, so you could get an overview of these issues because that's kind of where we are. It's not we don't have the resources to get any more information than anyone else has on these issues. So it's in that sense, we're, we're severely strained when it comes to capacity and, and understanding the, the, the field. Um, and in that sense, documents like this one for, uh, fulfill a very important role in setting things in motion because governments are very reactive uh, constructs. They tend to um, adapt to circumstances changing or they tend to adapt to incoming documents. Um, so I think that it's 
important to remember also that governments are very heterogeneous uh, creations. Not all parts of government, but governments do agree um, on, on, uh, on issues. Uh, in fact, I would say that more than, more than half of my working day uh, consists of making sure that there is an, a single government position on um, issues uh, such as these ones. And it's very difficult um, when working in government to relate to the general feel or the general discussion within um, the internet governance world writ large. It's very, very difficult as a government individual to do that. And this is not a new phenomenon. Um, I remember working in 2008 with the EU telecoms package, which was a very controversial piece of legislation that uh, passed, through, um, uh, passed through the EU. And there was a massive um, sort of society protest against the exclusion of, uh, of rights-based, of, of rights language in that, in that um, a piece of legislation. However, it was extremely difficult as a government to react to this because there wasn't a single document. There was no, nothing had been sent in. There was just a general notion of discontent that was really hard to, hard to grasp. So what happens then is that it's very difficult as a diplomat working within the international field to accurately convey the notion that there are norms and standards and expectations within international society to other government ministries. Uh, because I would, I would in, in working in this, you should, one should also, uh, also remember that the disconnect between domestic policy making and international policy making within governments is just now starting to be bridged. So up until now, it's been, it's been very concretely um, uh, so that internet, national internet policy making um, has to a large extent been the remit of um, the ministries of commerce for enterprise and communications who have a very small, um, have a very, a very small um, uh, contact surface to international affairs. That's changing now. We're seeing now, for instance, that the Swedish delegation here to SGF is uh, two, two foreign ministries, three individuals and one uh, person from the Ministry of Enterprise. That would not have been the case um, uh, just a few years ago. So that, that is definitely changing. But um, I, sh I should say that that, that particular aspect is, is tremendously important. Because as, a, as, a wor as, as somebody working in the Foreign Service, you will need to present a concrete document that you will be able to send to other government ministries when you're doing policy making. So it's, it's, has, it's a very, um, it's a very down to earth, it has a very down to earth, um, very concrete um, impact in terms of being able to point to something that is actually going on um, in the outside, in the outside world. So um, I'll, I'll just close with that, just uh, that, that, that um, bit of an overview of how these things function. And I would just like to commend you on this important work that is obviously now being circulated um, on intra-governmental email lists in, in our and other governments. And that does matter because that, um, that is possibly one of the few ways that we can connect the broader norms of human rights to, um, to the implementation and the discussion about how to, how to implement. Because that's normally not, some, some, uh, well, that's not, not, not something that's normally done within governments. It's not, you don't normally write elaborate analysis or elaborate documents about how we should, it's, it's quite simply not, not time for that. So we, we, we are heavily reliant on inputs um, from, from uh, external actors. So we're very grateful for that and, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carl. And with that, I'd like to open it up to the audience. I see one hand already. If, um, if you want to comment, um, respond. Oh, I can see three hands, four hands, five hands. Great. Uh, that's what I like to see. So I'll start with Eduardo. Keep putting your hands up so I keep seeing you. Okay, thank you. And thanks for this presentation. I, I like it, Mike's definition of multi-stakeholder man. So I will use that <laughs> definition <laughs> to present myself. I, I, I worked as a in the private sector as a private lawyer in the past, defending journalists and media outlets. I worked in an intergovernmental organization. I was special reporter for freedom of expression at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Uh, and now I worked uh, for many NGOs. And now I am working in the academia. I'm a law professor. I'm an 
I'm the director of the Center for Studies on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information at Palermo University in Buenos Aires. Um, my comments and suggestions. Um, I, I started the discussion uh, of the charter three years ago in Buenos Aires. We hosted Frank LaRue's regional meeting. Uh, your former colleague, Dixie, Elisa Corner, was there presenting the first draft of the charter. And we, di we, we, we started the discussion about the importance of having this kind of document. Uh, and it was a very, very first draft. So I'm very happy to see that today the charter is printed. It is on the website. Uh, and I would say that it would be important to have some sort of final document. I understand that it's important to have a document that could be you know, uh, completed or, or amended or whatever, but for advocacy purposes, I think that it's important to have something concrete because if you presented, and this happens to me a lot of time, if you presented a document as an ongoing document, it doesn't have the power to convince the people that you have there something important. So I suggest to sell the idea that this is in some way the final draft of the charter. So it's the charter, okay? It could be open in the future, but this is the, 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 the document. Um, in, in terms of how to use the document, and this is, was your second question, Dixie, as far as I remember, uh, now I'm jumping to my, my academic vision. Uh, I think that one way to use the document is, as Marianne said, uh, in, 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 in courses. Uh, I am teaching human rights and the internet in, in, in my university. And it is very common that students, when they take the course, they think that we are going to talk about internet and freedom of expression and privacy, and that's it. So the charter is very useful, uh, and I introduced the charter in one of my last classes uh, as a review of all of the course. It's very useful because open the mind of people that are approaching to this idea of human rights and the internet, that human rights and the internet is much, much broader than freedom of expression and, and privacy. So I think that using the charter if in the academic sector is important to spread the word of the charter, but also to, for pedagogical issues, to explain that when you talk about human rights and the internet, you are talking about much more things than freedom of expression and, and, and privacy. And my last point is languages. Uh, I am using in my, in my courses an old version that was translated into Spanish. Um, I would be happy that our center in, in Buenos Aires uh, look the um, difference between the, this last document and the documents that was translated before and to have the final document in Spanish as well. But I think that this document will be more and more powerful if it is translated to many, many other languages. So we are going to do that. I talked to Marianne in the past and said uh, that it will be easy because we have a first version in Spanish. So we need just to check if the version that we have is the same version of, the, of this last uh, document. But I encourage other academic institutions or advocate, advocates to put this, this, this charter into other languages as well. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Very helpful. I've got some more hands. I'll add you to the list. I'm going to pass it to Andrew first and then to, to you. Oh, and please do introduce yourselves to the room. Thank you. Hi. <coughs> Thanks, Dixie. Andrew Podifat from Global Partners Digital, based in London. The head of ICANN, Fadi Jihadi, has talked quite a lot recently about there being orphan issues within the sphere of the internet. Do people on the panel think that there are human rights issues which are orphan issues within the current system? And do you think we need more principles, which is one of the things that the Brazilian summit has promised to look at? And do we need a different kind of internet management to deal with those orphan issues, which has also been a topic that will be raised at the Rio summit next year? Uh, is that what human rights needs at the moment? More principles and a different kind of management structure? Thank you. Um, questions like that I'll collect and then we'll go back to the panel. Um, please, the gentleman. 
Thank you very much. I'm Derek Cogburn, uh, Executive Director of the Institute on Disability and Public Policy for the ASEAN region, and also a professor at American University in the School of International Service in our International Communication Program. And I want to commend you for uh, a great document, very comprehensive, and I particularly uh, uh, am thankful for your inclusion of Article uh, Principle 13 uh, on the rights of persons with disabilities uh, on the internet. And I have uh, three or four suggestions uh, for you. And I guess uh, uh, I may differ a little bit from our colleague from Buenos Aires about the concreteness of it. I think there's certainly benefit of having the charter being able to be presented as a concrete document. And so printing it makes sense and, and you want to be able to have it in that way. Um, but I think there's also uh, perhaps room for continued evolution and improvement of the document with greater input. And I don't know if that's, uh, I, you know, I don't know exactly the process that you've gone through. You guys are having some challenges up there. <laughs> so I don't know exactly the process uh, that you've gone through, but at least in this area, I, I could see some interesting contributions that uh, additional voices might make to strengthening principle 13. So for example, um, uh, whereas you rec uh, referenced article four of the CRPD uh, to focus on the human rights nature of the whole convention, uh, and it's seen as the first human rights treaty of the 21st century, and so I think that's right uh, to focus on that and to bring it into the human rights uh, um, uh, body of, uh, of treaties and so forth. But I think there are additional elements of uh, the, con the CRPD that are relevant, particularly in an internet governance context. So I would highlight uh, Article 8, which focuses on awareness. So Article eight, each article I'm referring to is in the CRPD. So Article 8 in the CRPD is on awareness raising. So uh, you could highlight the use of the internet to raise awareness about disability issues and, and about persons with disabilities. Uh, article 9 of the CRPD focuses on accessibility, very explicitly on accessibility. And it has two aspects of accessibility, uh, physical accessibility and electronic accessibility. And the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities right now, right now, is taking uh, comments on how the, com the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities should interpret Article uh, 9 on accessibility. So this is an opportunity for everybody here that um, is interested in this area and has expertise in how the UN uh, might interpret uh, Article 9 on accessibility to weigh in. And I can give the organizers the link to the um, uh, Office of High Commission for Human Rights uh, where that uh, call for comment is available and it would be great to have people to comment on that. Uh, Article 24, Marianne, focuses on education. I'm over here. <laughs> uh, Article 24, this is Derek, uh, focuses on education. So Marianne, your comments uh, you know, certainly relate to uh, uh, this article. And then uh, Article 29 focuses on political participation, which I think would be another area that's linked uh, to this area. So again, I think focusing on Article 4 is great because it puts it in the human rights context, but I think there's a slightly uh, broader context that you could engage with the CRPD. And then lastly, the UN General Assembly a few weeks ago held a high-level meeting on disability and development, basically trying to articulate the post-2015 development agenda. So after the MDGs in, um, uh, what will happen? And they adopted an outcome document that says now across the UN system, similar to the way the MDGs tried to organize much of the activity of the UN system, there'll now be this integration of disability and development. So I just think that that's, this is a powerful moment to uh, add to what you're trying to do. Thank you very much. And to say that the, uh, relevant to that, the IRP coalition meeting is on Thursday morning. You'll see that in the agenda. So that will be a chance to go into those kind of um, substantial issues in more, in more detail. I'm gonna pass on, I'm in the interest of time, please like two minutes or something or, or even less, wonderful. Uh, I'm gonna pass to Max from <coughs> Google. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Max Senges. I, um, as many of us have uh, had several uh, stakeholder hats on, um, now I work uh, with Google in Germany. And um, I 
I'd like to um, comment on the idea of uh, this um, ever being a final document, which um, I think is, is going to be impossible because of the nature of the internet and the evolutions that um, happen and the need to adapt and uh, to understand how the technology, uh, what implication it has on human rights. So I don't think uh, there should be a final document, but there could be final versions and clear versioning um, that indicates that this is uh, a consolidated status. Um, but what my comment is about really is about um, the principles part of the charter. I think uh, this is an, an excellent um, outcome of many consultations. Um, however, 99% is on the rights, and I think there is some principles um, in the punchy charter, but um, <coughs> when it comes to the, the longer version, it is, um, I think, um, not, uh, they're not as present. Um, and I'm wondering how the relationship between the punchy charter is to the long charter and whether um, you plan to have any work um, going in this direction and just um, looking at neutrality in um, particular standards and regulation and governance seem the ones that uh, um, have taken up quite some international debate also. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now there's a gentleman over on this side and then over here. Please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is uh, Sriti Prayanaji. Uh, I'm a blogger activist and currently I'm uh, with the ISOC Nepal chapter. My question uh, to you guys is, um, you know, there are different cha charters and uh, rights uh, that have been approved and uh, that is uh, online. Uh, but uh, what I see is, especially in, in context of the developing countries, uh, there is a big gap in between uh, the actual charters right and the action actionability, uh, especially in the developing countries uh, context. Uh, how can we overcome or how can we bridge uh, it? And um, um, as you might know, there are a number of issues of uh, human rights uh, cases that are happening despite the uh, fact that the countries have signed in a lot of charters. And, and, and another question is, how practical is it to criminalize uh, freedom of expression? Can you explain the last question? Uh, how practical is it to criminalize uh, freedom of expression? What in, do you mean by that? Uh, in context of, uh, you know, uh, in especially in Nepal, uh, there have been cases where bloggers and uh, journalists have been, uh, you know, they have been arrested for writing articles and, um, you know, recently uh, one of the uh, associate editors uh, were, was, um, he was uh, arrested by police just uh, for sharing a news in his official fan page. The news was uh, done uh, three months back and when he had shared it in his uh, Facebook fan page, the government, uh, the, the police um, um, had, uh, you know, arrested him. So. That is a, a growing issue, I think, criminalization. I've certainly heard you speech on that one, so that's something we can try and touch on. Uh, sorry. Okay, uh, the lady at the front, and then Miriam at the back, and then we'll go around to the panel, and then we'll come back. Um, hi, uh, thank you. My name is Xian Hong Fu from UNESCO. It's a big pleasure to be here, and uh, first of all, I want to thank, uh, I want to congratulate uh, the coalition on this uh, great outcome. And uh, just a quick pick from the, our bloggers uh, intervention on that, uh, as uh, the, s the safety issues and the free expression of the new uh, media actors such as bloggers, which has been really included into UN action plan on protecting journalists as a safety and uh, to address the issue of impunity <coughs> because nowadays the journalism notion has been renovated to include uh, not only the professional uh, licensed uh, journalists but also those uh, uh, bloggers, individuals who are producing news items, information on internet. Um, that's the one feedback to that. And uh, coming back to this um, uh, IRP uh, principles, uh, I do appreciate it because it provides a very inclusive framework to address uh, complex digital rights. And in parallel, you know, you know UNESCO as an intergovernmental organization, we are also uh, under, uh, un under demand by our member states to address the internet related issues uh, with a renovated uh, uh, conceptual framework. We are now exploring 
exploring a new concept uh, to sensitize our member states uh, on the internet governance. We, we, stay, we call it internet universality. There we have four pillars uh, principles. Some of us we do uh, have the inspiration from your charter. For example, the first pillar of the universality is uh, human rights based. Yes, the internet should be used to promote free expression, and we should have the privacy protection. And also, we address the multiple human rights as we uh, we stand out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Not only free expression, but also privacy and right to education, as you mentioned, and right to cultural diversity and participation, and also right to uh, have the multilingualism in cyberspace. Many imp important information, medical science information, should be. Available available not only in English, but also many other languages. And uh, also the gender inequality on internet, uh, women's equal access and use of internet, uh, they are all included in this framework. That's one I appreciate. And second pillar of our internet universality concept, we talk about accessibility. In this accessibility, we go beyond the uh, notion of access, because um, it's not uh, just about um, access to the minimum level of infrastructure, but also we talked about uh, the social inclusion. Uh, we should have the equality uh, of access from those uh, different uh, uh, social group. We should not have the divide based on the social or social economic uh, status, yeah, such as the literacy, education level, such as the language. Uh, if they don't understand English, they still can access with the uh, domain name in their own language, access their information, and also based on gender and the disabilities, they should also be inclusive in this uh, access. The, that's a, and further, we go ahead with our to maybe one, one uh, issue neglected is that the, the uh, media information literacy, digital literacy of all of us, even those educated people, uh, adults, they, I think all of us need to uh, be more, to to be active digital citizens in this uh, cyberspace, we need a sort of uh, skills, competence, and to, to critically, to be more constructively use uh, and uh, access the internet and uh, it's, uh, to, to get uh, development from it. So that's uh, two areas I, I like to, uh, to share. The other two pillars on this universality is about the, uh, the openness and, uh, and uh, multi-stakeholder. I won't sure. elaborate, but we, ha we will have a, yes, I'll just uh, uh, yeah. finish with my, <laughs> with, with, with sure. a question, with a question that, uh, so I, uh, from my point of view, I will also echo the other question. What's the next step for, you for this charter? What do you do to <coughs> implement it? Thank you. Thank you, Jean Hong, and UNESCO are a, a very important partner in kind of pushing these broad understandings of human rights. I'm going to um, pass on to Mary M, so panelists get ready because then I'll come back to you guys. Thank you, Dixie. I'm Mary Mazuki, an, an academic based in Paris with the um, French National Research Center. I'm a member of the IRP coalition, and as Dixie mentioned, uh, in her opening uh, comments, I was one of the human rights experts who reviewed the charter. Since this panel is discussing uh, uh, ways on how to use this, uh, this charter, I would like to mention one very important way to use this charter, and this is making law out of it. Law at the national level, law at the regional level, or law even at, uh, uh, at the global level. And I would like to mention one first um, uh, experience uh, with the, the using the charter in making law instrument, although it is only soft law, but still very important. The Council of Europe has um, uh, specifically tried to institutionalize the uh, work that we did with this uh, charter in the IRP coalition, and it has set up a committee of experts to prepare, to prepare a guide, what is now a guide for human rights of uh, internet uh, user. It still has to be uh, adopted by the, uh, at the ministerial level uh, in the Council of Europe, but the draft guide is already available and will be uh, open for discussion at a session on Friday. But again, 
uh, this is one experience by the Council of Europe, and I think it, this experience c could be used and maybe uh, reproduced in other parts of the world, in other region, or even at the national level, and this is a very important achievement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're hearing about lots of different initiatives building out of the Charter. A lot of them are still in the space of soft law. We also have questions about whether it, we should try and harden it into a final document or leave it open. There are questions about whether human rights represent one of these orphaned issues in the internet governance field that need to be taken somewhere, potentially through a new mechanism. Um, the, the gaps in developing countries between rights and realities. I'm going to leave it open to my panelists to choose which um, issues they want to pick up on. Um, I'll pass to Carl Frederick. Well, um, I wanted to start by addressing um, Andrew's issue, um, his question, whether or not we need new mechanisms and if this is an orphan issue. Um, I, it's. Right now, I would say that um, we don't really know what's going on, to be frank. Um, where it seems that there are so many new suggestions floating around, the Brazilians' proposals um, and, and uh, all of the different uh, initiatives that are being taken um, will clearly need to be uh, become more, more clear and well-pronounced before we know what this is actually going to become. But What's clear, though, is that I, don't, I wouldn't say that we need new mechanisms for, for, for discussing human rights language. I think that um, we, we, whatever new institutions we have, they will need to be underpinned by, by human rights principles. Um, I, would, I wouldn't want to see um, the issue isolated to a, new, a, a certain new mechanisms, but rather I think um, the, the the somewhat generalized consensus seems to be arising that human rights does do need to be integrated, well integrated, deep into the fabric of any potential new um, setup. So I think that would be my preliminary answer to that at least. But um, as I said, like everyone else, we're, we're just trying to get a grasp of, of what's, what's really happening. Thanks. Thank you, Carl Frederick. Would anyone else on the panel like to respond to any of the questions or points raised? Yes, Michael. Oh, sorry. I'd actually like to respond to all the questions, and we'll be here for the next 30 minutes doing that. Um, very good questions. But let me put on my skeptical physicist hat. Um, in my opening remarks, I was very positive on this this initiative because it's, it is a very positive one. It's getting a very good discussion going about fundamental issues that need to be addressed online and offline. The problem with the document as it stands now is that it's not going to be read by the CEOs, the CFOs, the engineers, the marketing people who really need to absorb it and factor it into their work. For this to really be successful, it has to be like some of the higher level documents coming out of the UN that Microsoft has endorsed and other companies have endorsed, it can't be quite as specific as it is now. And it also has to be more realistic. Uh, um, just to point one example, at the very end of the charter you have general clauses, 21A, interdependence of all rights in the charter. All rights contained in this charter are interdependent and mutually reinforcing. No way. Many of the rights listed here conflict with each other. The right to freedom of speech is going to lead some people to say things that will be seen as hate crime or impinging on someone's freedom of religion. And that's more so on the internet than anywhere else. So we have to, in this document and in our discussions, recognize that rights are ideals and they conflict. And to not realize that in this document, I think, would meet, lead a lot of people to say, how can I implement it? And they'll, they'll set it aside. I don't think this can ever be implemented in law, hard law. It certainly can be implemented in soft law and norms. And that's what we've done at Microsoft. But again, you have to make clear limits. Uh, another example in, as in the principles page where we talk about neutrality of the Internet. Microsoft is 
firmly on the side of those who don't want to see discrimination among services on the internet. We provide Skype, and there are dozens of countries that block Skype. On the other hand, this language says the internet will be free from prioritization or traffic control. Every network that provides support for the internet has traffic control. And that's not going to change. Particularly for wireless networks, I want traffic control. I want the bits that are coming from my heart monitor to get through before a porn video. And again, so there's, there's places in here where we're too detailed, we're too bound to today's technology, and we're not actually going to accomplish the goals that the, the authors have set out to do. I also think it would not be helpful to, s to try to freeze this and say, this is the final document. The, the, the great thing about this document is it has led to a lot of very good discussion. Um, there are some things I'd like to see added to this. Uh, when I was working with the Internet Society as their vice president for policy, which in, in addition to my full-time job at IBM, we came up with, with six abilities. Um, after a lot of discussion, we decided not to use rights language, partly because a lot of people in certain parts of the world see rights as something that the U.S. is trying to force on them. So we talked about abilities. And one of the most important abilities was the ability to innovate, the ability to take technology and do new things. And that, again, is a goal that I think is in here, but we need to, we need to talk about some of these other things that support human rights. We don't need a right to innovate. We don't need a right to be forgotten. We don't need a right to the silence of the chips. There's a lot of these rights that are floating around, but we do need the ability to innovate to provide for better solutions and better options so that we can actually promote and protect human rights using the technology of the internet, the cloud, the internet of things, and, and all the rest. Um, I, I uh, hope I haven't been too skeptical, but um, I, I, I do think this is a very valuable effort and I'm glad to be here and able to comment on them. Thank you. Um, just on net neutrality, I think if you're watching pornography, you definitely want your heart monitor coming through at the same time. <laughs> so I'm um, going just put a pitch in there for that. Um, uh, I think uh, I'm really pleased you just made your remarks, actually, because um, I think it's these, these conceptual differences are precisely why we need to have multi-stakeholder processes. Um, because, of course, there's absolutely no, no um, doubt that human rights conflict um, uh, and that isn't at all what the intention of Article 29 is about. What it's about saying is that where these rights conflict uh, in human rights terms, we need to resolve those conflicts in ways that are rights affirming. Um, and I'm really excited because um, APC has got an internet rights curriculum training and you're going to be invited to come and participate <laughs> in it so that we can share some of these concepts and ideas. Um, but, but seriously, I mean, I, I think it's good that, you, that you're uh, um, and talking about this as private sector perspectives because I think that's how we get understanding um, and also how we uh, in civil society can know what are the um, challenges that private sector face when they're responding to how governments want them to engage on human rights. So I think that's, that, that's really critical and thank you, thank you for it. Um, I want to answer Andrew's question um, and I want to be, and I want to be answer it clearly and firmly. Um, ICANN is not a human rights standard making body. I just want to say that again. It is not a human rights standard making body. Um, and human rights are not an orphan issue in internet governance. They have a very clear, very strong home uh, across multiple international networks and national networks as well. Uh, and I uh, strongly object to any suggestion that ICANN uh, could construct human rights is some kind of orphan issue over which it might have some kind of aegis. It's a private corporation. I'm, I'm a councillor on the GNSO council in ICANN, so I'm, I'm speaking from a space of, of knowledge and, and engagement. And I can tell you that um, we've struggled, um, and the non-commercial user constituency in particular has struggled to get um, ICANN to even accept that as a private corporation doing public policy, it has, it has human rights obligations. Um, so I think it's very dangerous and I'm very concerned that um, uh, there might be some thought about ICANN having, having a new role. I think it would be great if ICANN joined the Global Network Initiative. I mean, look at the leadership of Microsoft and others who've done so. Um, 
you know, put the money where the mouth is and, 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 and walk the talk. That, that's my view. Having said that, I think that um, uh, it's good if ICANN is talking about human rights with governments. Um, it needs to in relation to the Government Advisory Committee and what's going on there. Um, and uh, I, we'd want to see more of that and more pushing. And I think the Charter is, a, is an excellent tool for that, um, particularly if we look at issues of right to culture and new GTLDs, Dot Patagonia, for example. Um, we want rights discourse in there. Um, I, I also want, just want to acknowledge the point that was made about the gap between uh, rights, standards and practice, of course. Um, and I think the Global South and developing countries need to um, strategize more and work more together on this and, um, and share more of that with the, um, their brothers and sisters from the Global North, um, and particularly around things like the new forms of, of rights violations, such as criminalizing expression. Um, and, and finally, just to say, I mean, there are innovative ways that we're seeking to use the Charter. For example, we're citing it in our Universal Periodic Review assessments of countries' human rights performance. Uh, I think that there are aids to interpretation, which it, which it can offer. And um, I feel a little bit like Margaret Atwood in The, in the Handmaid's Tale, um, which is a, a story of about a, a secret language that, that uh, women feel they can't use because they don't have enough words to, to use it, and, and the protagonist asks, well, how many words do you have? And they say, well, we've got 2,000. And they say, well, actually, most people use less than 1,000 words in everyday language, so you can begin. So my, my, my point is I think we should just begin to start using the charter um, and not, and not uh, worry about crystallising it too much, um, but just acknowledging the limitations of where we are at this point. Thanks. There's Valentina in the audience and then back to Marianne. Is that okay? Oh, wait, if Marianne's just following on quickly, I'll let her go first. If, if anyone else has points to make, just put your hand up. Oh. Um, yeah, I just wanted to follow on. I think these comments are extremely um, valuable, and thank you. And I think the criticisms, particularly the, 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 the eye for detail, is very important at this point as we move the charter forward. I just want to more, uh, work, respond directly to Max's point about the relationship between what we call the ten punchy principles and the longer charter. I certainly enjoy, I just want to say I endorse entirely what Joy has just said. Um, if we start using the term orphan, we start to disempower. Uh, orphans have rights as well, and even if they are orphans, it's less the point than they're orphans. Um, so uh, my point about the, the ten principles is that this is exactly this. They weren't they were devised to, in order to distill what is a very complex document, the charter itself, for outreach and um, educational purposes. I don't think they were ever, people can correct me here, designed to be it's sort of the ultimate statement on principle setting. But human rights are in themselves a form of principle. Um, not all principles are human rights. So in the sense the 10 principles max is simply there as a kind of uh, way in. I use them in uh, outreach situations because you can get them pretty much on one slide, even though you have to sort of get a bit crowded. So that's what they are. I think the longer chart is what we're trying to focus on now in order to generate this very discussion. To look at things that are missing, as Derek has highlighted, and to concentrate on what may seem like contradictions. But here, Michael, I would like to suggest, as Joy has, that interdependence does not necessarily mean the same. Interdependence does not necessarily mean there are not tensions. And the UN uh, covenants, all of them, are in themselves tensions, is a push and a pull. It's how you actually implement these tensions in real life, nitty gritty situations. And for me, whilst I know it's a political rule, the more detail, the less agreement, I would like to forge on nonetheless and concentrate just on these details within a broad framework of human rights, understanding that interdependence is not the same as being the same. It's working through the tensions in a uh, coherent and proportional way. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Um, it's the last time back to the audience, so if you have quick comments to make, there's Valentina and then the gentleman there. Hi, good morning. Valentina from a small country called Bosnia and Herzegovina, activist. I'm a multi-stakeholder person. I'm a citizen. I pay the taxes, so I'm into the government. I'm uh, a user, so I give my data for free, and then the biggie data can sell my data and all the citizens' data of the world. So I'm into cooperation. But I'm truly an activist. And I think it's important uh, that we, when we stand up our multi-stakeholder, it's really important to know who we are. And I think listening to, to what uh, the gentleman for the Microsoft says, I think that 
uh, there is nothing bad in being a man from the corporation. What I find really difficult for me to accept is if someone says that the word rights is something not to be used because some governments or government thinks that this belongs uh, to US. I think that we have to keep rights where they are. We need rights. Um, that's the way I understood. My, I my yes, that's why I'm talking. So if you let me finish, it would be nice. Thank you very much. So I find the IGF a very important space because it's the space where we can talk. And I think it's important that we talk and that we talk with all our identities. But I think the rights are essential if we want that. The world is a world of citizens. And I would also say maybe the, the charter is, is general, but listening that the charter could not be used because as a not practical implication, I think it's a place for dialogue and discussion and for opening up a place. But if someone has a principle, if, someone, if something is difficult in being implemented, it's not a good reason to think that it would never be implemented or would never be used. Thank you. Thanks for the chance to correct your misunderstanding. What I commented on was what the Internet Society was trying to do 10 years ago when it was developing its outline for its public policy agenda. It wasn't developing a rights agenda. We were trying to develop some way to clearly say what the Internet Society would work for. And in the end, we used the language ability rather than rights because for our purpose, which was to push for a more open, interoperable, accessible Internet, we were able to convey what we wanted without using the rights language. I wasn't saying that rights are not a term we should use. For that context, it wasn't the one that we needed to use. I think, and I, and I, and I also didn't say that I was the one saying we shouldn't use it. <laughs> it was an active discussion, an international discussion. And in America, we use the term rights quite often and quite effectively. So thanks again for letting me correct that. Okay, we're running on out of time, so I have the gentleman from the back and then quick 20, 30 second wrap ups from each panelist. Thank you, everyone. My name is Ashraf Mikhail. I am from the Danish Institute for Human Rights. Um, and, and, the, and, the, and the questions are related, <laughs> um, related to w way forward. Uh, probably this has been discussed uh, previously. But um, <coughs> since all articles uh, um, related to international standards, um, uh, I, I wonder why the way, the, the, the way forward to work to advocate for, f uh, for the tre treaty body for existing international mechanism that this is to be including in included in the monitoring and uh, system is already so that's that's something in line with the uh, general command num uh, number 34 on freedom of expression. So if, if, if there is more interpretations in uh, 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 to the work related to the treaty body, for example, that will uh, imply that the state have to report on this civil society as well can monitor. So in this way to get it more into operations and, uh, and we get an overview what is actually the status uh, uh, on internet freedom on, on the war. Thank you very much. Um, so, final wrap-ups from our panelists. Um, please do feel free to comment on the last comment as well about monitoring the, the charter as it is and seeing how it's enforced at the moment. Uh, I would like to go from left to right. So I'm going to start with Carl Frederick. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief. I think that moving forward, I think they should. Um, I would. I would. I think it would be a good idea to more do more targeted outreach, um, not only targeting foreign ministries in accordance with what I was just saying, but um, perhaps trying to more actively identify actors within countries that you would want to affect with this, um, and make sure that you do um, uh, try to send this to the right people because this obviously needs to be circulated widely, but it's not always the foreign ministries in other country that has the responsibility to do this. I also want just briefly to commend UNESCO for the important work that they've done on internet universality, which is, I think is a concept that should be um, made more um, public awareness about. Thank you very much. Uh, 
just wanted to comment quickly on on the uh, on on a point that came up in in different ways uh, once through Max and uh, and and on for instance the the not quite overlap between the ten punchy principles and and the rest of the charter. So if you look at the provision on uh, net neutrality and net equality uh, in the charter, it's much more uh, uh, much more well phrased because it talks about uh, uh, there not being special privileges uh, on certain kinds of grounds, economic, social, cultural, or political, whereas the the ten uh, the neutrality principle in the punchy principles doesn't do that, hence leading to different kinds of interpretations of it uh, and its ramifications on, on heart monitoring traffic on the IP networks, right? So uh, that I, I don't think is intended and, and that I think there is uh, more work to be done on, on this. Uh, and on, on the I, on how best this is to be used, I, I actually tend to just agree with, with Joy that uh, it's best used by, by reference. Uh, so one way would be to say uh, uh, that uh, here we have a set of principles. Let's see how different countries match up to those principles. I don't think that uh, that works because the charter hasn't quite achieved that status yet. And, and I'm not sure whether it, it uh, ever will be the defining document of, of what we are trying to do. But on the other hand, there are things like the Universal Periodic Review, et cetera. And, and by reference, I think this charter can become more important uh, in, in the space that it occupies. And, and that, I think, is one way of, of going forward. Thank you. I just want to say that I really appreciate the chance to be here and to be part of this discussion. I'm very glad it is such a diverse audience and such a diverse panel. Uh, quite often when you come to a discussion of human rights, it's human rights lawyers talking to each other. And in order for this to be effective, you really do have to talk to the whole gamut of government, industry, activists, academia, average citizens. And you have to talk in a way that they can understand. Uh, at Microsoft, we've been real leaders in developing technologies for the disabled community, partly because we think that's the right thing to do, but partly also because it's a way to engage a larger community in using the tools that we're developing. And that's, that's another part of the story that we can tell here, that rights have benefits beyond being the right thing to do. Um, and so th there's a marketing pitch to be done here, and I uh, really commend the group for, for doing such a good job of trying to bring the classic ideas of human rights into cyberspace. Thank you again. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'd like to echo that actually. I think uh, it's, and it's good to have some dissonance because I think we can easily become somewhat formulaic about our mantra of the multi-stakeholder model and different perspectives and then we actually don't disagree with each other and that's just really boring. Um, <laughs> and it's also not the point. You know, the point is we want to know what our differences are and we want to explore and understand them and then find ways to move forward together with those differences um, in some common purpose. So, um, so no, I'm, I, I think that's been a useful discussion. Uh, I think, I'd just reiterate that I think the Charter has some useful practical uh, value, particularly, for example, in working with women's, women's rights activists to try and articulate, you know, for them and with them um, the particular rights uh, issues that internet rights advocates are, are pushing for and for them to be able to think how to integrate that into their work. Um, and I think there are opportunities for collaboration that we should really try and, and reach out for, um, for example, for the for the Dynamic Coalition to be having some side events at some of these other human rights meetings, um, to to put forward the charter and to talk and uh, deepen understanding about it. Um, thank you very much. We clearly have started the work we need to keep moving and talking about on Thursday morning, at nine o'clock. And tomorrow we have a whole panel also organised by the IRP coalition on disadvantaged groups and the internet where some of these very important issues can be broached. But my final point is this. Max's point about generational versions is very important because we're talking about developing a legacy here 
and hopefully taking part in joining another legacy and a sort of genealogy, a family tree of documents. So I think I agree with Eduardo, we're just getting on with it, which is why it's in this 1.1 version. And that is good enough for now. And there are clearly things to address, sloppy kind of phrasing, some unnecessary contradictions. So in that sense, I would stress that we're working towards Charter 2.0, whatever that is. But this is still a valid, concrete thing. And thank you very much, everyone, for confirming and affirming the work and giving us ideas to actually take that further. So that's my um, IRP coalition hat on. I've, I talked to 400 schoolboys about this, so the 10 principles help. We just have to start talking about it and using it and then go from there. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Can we have a round of applause for the panel? Please?